Hey guys, we're back. Camera's on. Cameras on, please. All right, so we talked about the sales comparison approach in the first half of this uh, uh, this chapter, um, and now we're going to talk about the cost approach and then the income approach. Now, the cost approach, as the name kind of indicates, is the cost of the building, right? How much does it cost to build? You guys got it? The cost approach is about the cost of building. So uh, let's write this down real quick. Of building. All right. Next, there's different types of cost approach that can be that can be used. We also have to consider uh, the appraised value minus depreciation value in order to get to the actual uh, estimate or uh, value that we will consider for the appraisal itself. So the cost approach is most often used for, pay attention to this, recently built properties recently built properties that's one of them recently built properties but also this is because the actual cost of development and construction are are known we know exactly how much it costs so we'll use that value but it's also used for special purpose buildings which cannot be valued by other methods because non merry comparables or they don't generate income so the cost approach is for those properties that again don't do not generate do not have comparable sales or do not generate income again recently built properties if it's recently built how can i compare an older property to the recently built or recently built to the older property right they're totally different. So we use cost approach. Now the strengths of the cost approach are that it provides an upper limit for the subject's value based on undepreciated costs of reproducing the improvements, right? So undepreciated costs because, hey, it's new. If it's, a, if it's the a new construction so they still didn't have a chance to lose value as an example uh, it's very accurate for property with new improvements which are highest and best use of the property and the limitations so these are good things the limitations of the cost approach is that the cost to improve to to create improvements is not necessarily the same as market value and depreciation is very difficult to measure especially for older buildings now, why is the cost to create improvements necessar not necessarily the same as market value? Because for me to create an improvement, like build a property, right, in Newark, it will have a different value. The same build out, right, the same exact build out will have a different value in New York. All right. So I can have a, a single family, three bedroom, two bath, a um, thousand square feet, right, and bring it the same design same layout bring it to new york and these two will have different values and let's not talk about new york let's talk about between newark and elizabeth from elizabeth to linden right neighboring towns they have different values 
altogether, different markets. So the cost might be one thing, the price or value might be another. Okay. Newer buildings tend to have similar uh, price and value if they're within the same area. So if I build four houses in a row, they're all brand new, they all cost pretty much the same. So the cost, the, the market value will most likely be the same, right? Or very close to it. Now the cost approach generally aims to estimate either the reproduction cost or the replacement cost of the subject property. When we talk about reproduction cost, is the cost of constructing at current prices a precise or exact duplicate of the subject's improvements. So what we're saying is we used copper pipes originally in this building. How much does copper piping cost today for, for, the, for labor and the material? Will it be the same? Most likely not. So attributing a value based on replacing the same material, it's called reproduction cost. If we replace with different material that serves the same purpose, so its function is equivalent, it's almost like, let, let's, let's think about aftermarket as an example. If you guys go to, to the dealer where you bought your car and you use manufacturer's pro, uh, parts, Usually they way more expensive than if you go to a regular mechanic that says, hey, listen, I don't have the manufacturer's one, but I got these brakes that do the same thing, right? Or I got these uh, uh, spark plugs that do the same thing. They're not at the dealer. They're at the, a, a mechanic. They serve the same purpose. Are you guys understanding? So reproduction is like going back to factory. Replacement is, hey, there's different material. Let's use a different material, serves the same purpose. It's usually cheaper. This one right here, the replacement cost, is the one that insurance companies usually use. All right, so when they, they want to uh, insure your property, they're basing on, okay, material is new, right? Newer material and construction standards, we're gonna use that approach. Any questions? Not hard, right? Reproduction back to factory, uh, replacement, different material that serves the same function or does the same thing. Now, a cornerstone or pillar or, or base of the construction approach is the concept of depreciation. So depreciation, depreciation is loss of value in any improvement over time, okay? What is loss of value in any improvement over time? Since land is assumed to retain its value indefinitely, land does not depreciate. Land does not depreciate. Land is land. The depreciation only applies to the improved portion of the real property. What is the improved portion? The building. Right? So land is land, does not lose value. Land is land. But the building over time needs maintenance. Right? The building over time needs something to be replaced. So it depreciates. It's just like your car. What is the reason that you get out of a dealer and the car loses $5,000 in value automatically? Because now you're using it. While it was unused, it had value. You started using it, that's it. Value is gone because something is bound to break eventually. I didn't say getting out of your dealer, hopefully not. It did happen to me once though, brand new car and motor mounts were off, I almost got into an accident, but hey, went back to them, they fixed it. The point is, it loses value because of usage, because of mileage, yep, if that it starts counting. So your house is, has the same thing. As you're using, right, so inside, as you're using, things deteriorate. Things need to be replaced, things need to maintain, right? Outside, nature handles it. It's not you, it's nature. Nature says, hey, here comes the winds, destroy your vinyl and roof, right? The siding and the roof, right? So that's how it is. Um, so over time. Now, an appraiser considers depreciation is having, uh, as having three causes. There's physical deterioration, functional deterioration, and economic obsolescence. So let's look at these. 
this one if you guys get this when you get to the question is very easy to identify so easy to identify physical deterioration physical wear and tear the property loses value because of wear and tear and that loss of value could be curable or incurable right because if over time like 20 years later you still did not paint your rooms as an example you never painted your rooms well it's curable fresh coat of paint right but if over time you never fixed your roof it might be incurable the cost that they uh, the cost of re repairing it might be greater than the value of the structure and you probably think about why the roof well if you never fixed your roof maybe water infiltrated into your walls maybe cause other damages and to fix it's gonna be ridiculous or uh, a soil a soil that got uh, damaged or contaminated by a leak in the in your storage tank if it's an oil tank right so these are things that could be incurable just not worth it so curable is something that can be fixed easily incurable might not be worth it okay functional so physical is wear and tear functional we're talking about features of the property that are no longer desirable features of the property that are no longer desirable it could be curable or incurable so let's say as an example nowadays there's not many people at least in this area here there's not many people that have a living room and the dining room they've combined that into one the living room is the dining room or the kitchen became the dining room and the living room is the living room it's, uh, on itself or sometimes they find a way to share it by open concept right so that means that what was once the living room or the dining room could have been converted to a bedroom you guys understand so the function that that room served as it's no longer desirable we don't have time to sit down and have the dining room and, and living room for all of us to, no but we need another room just had another baby right so we convert one of the rooms to, to be a bedroom that's easily done so it's curable incurable the cost of the cure would exceed the contribution so it's very similar to the one above the cost to fix or adjust would um exceed what it would contribute to the to the actual value of the of the property for instance if the floor layout with bad traffic pattern would cost three times as much as ending the contribution to value i'll give you an example Mario went to see a property the other day and he was describing it to me. I remember properties like this a while back. And the layout, something like this. This is the door for you to get in. And then you have kitchen, right? Living room. Bedroom one. And this is the master bedroom, bedroom two. And then somewhere here, there was a, a bathroom as an example, and the master bedroom has a, a bathroom. But in case you guys did not realize, this is like a corridor. It looks great, right? no right you don't want a house where you have a little narrow we're talking about narrow corridor for you to go through the hallway right to, to go through it's very bad in some of these it's actually even worse in some of these the wall goes here to, for the bedrooms you'll get into one bedroom in order to get to the other bedroom You understand so to restructure the whole thing it might not make sense at all so you just keep it like this incurable so again the path 
traffic pattern within the house. Now, the word economic obsolescence can be interchanged here with external obsolescence, meaning it's based on stuff that's out of your control. It's external, out of your control. Okay? Usually, because it's out of your control, it's incurable. So, external obsolescence, incurable. There's no curable. So what do I mean when I say this? In the simplest way, right next across from the street, we have the railroad. Can I move the railroad? No. We're right on McCarter Highway on Route 21. You guys hear the ambulance and fire department and cops going all the time. Can I fix that? No. Can I move the building then where I'm at? No. So I suffer in the building. The value suffers from economic or external obsolescence, economical conditions of the market or things that are beyond the property. So the three ones you need to remember, let's recap real quick. Physical deterioration means wear and tear, maintenance that should have been done, right? It might be curable if you can easily fix it or incurable if you cannot easily fix it or the overall uh, just doesn't make sense we have the so, so that was physical we have the functional obsolescence or deterioration functional meaning hey uh we don't need this anymore we can rearrange it to something else right if it's possible to be arranged to something else like a living room to a bedroom or a bedroom that's like kids moved out and we have the extra bedroom let's make it a living room those are easy right interchangeable very easy that's a functional the function that that thing has in the property functional and number one number three economic or external if it's, it's things beyond your control what's happening on the market it's beyond your control uh what's out there right after your property as soon as you get out of your property it's beyond your control so it's always incurable these two curable or incurable this one always always incurable you got it? Thumbs up. Let me know you got it. Okay, cool. I do think people on YouTube sometimes go thumbs up as well, like I'm watching them. Imagine somebody's at home like, oh, not for me. <laughs> almost, it's almost like that guy at the parties that starts clapping and nobody claps around them. Right? Worst thing. You ever done that? Anybody? Oh, Francielli, of course. At least it's not just me. All right, everybody else is cool. Never had that, that scenario where... Um, the worst part is when you do that at church. I mean, just saying. All right, next. Just kidding. I didn't do it at church. It was a joke. Uh, steps in the approach. What are the steps? You did it in church? How did I know? All right. Um, I'm telling you, I analyze it all your lives already. I know everything about you. you. Kidding me? How can I teach you if I don't know you? I'm just kidding. It was a wild guess, and she went for it. That's how we we win. Uh, Americans got talent. We throw a couple stuff out there, and the people react. Boom! We know how it is. Next step. All right. Um, the cost approach has different steps. You need to know how to how to uh, establish those steps. And for you as a, as a realtor, again, we don't do this. But for you as a realtor, you have to be aware of what the process is. So if you need to dispute the process, okay? Should you learn how to do this in situations like what we said earlier, right? So Verona, you asked me, how would you figure out another way if there's no comparables? In situations like that, you might be able to use the cost approach, kind of. So having basic knowledge of this might help you determine the value. So the cost approach, the first step is figuring out the value of the land as if there was nothing on it. So we separate land from building. Separate land from building. Why? Because land does not depreciate. So we need to look at building as a depreciating asset and appreciating asset. Erica, I see you're typing. 
uh, we're going to estimate the cost of improvements, estimate and deduct accrued depreciation, and adding the estimated land value at the end to the depreciated value uh, of the cost of improvements. Okay, so these are the steps. Hold on, Erica's typing for the next half hour. Okay. Oh, she got it. Okay. Cool. Yes. So I'll go to that in a second. As far as this. Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions. Actually, in 2018, in December 20th of 2018, when they changed the state exam, they increased the amount of questions for appraisals. Yep, I restructured my whole teaching around the new, uh, the new exam back then. It hasn't changed since. I changed the book, but the exam hasn't changed. The questions are still the same. What do you mean, why? I'm like, I don't know, it wasn't me that decided. Why? Almost feel like, Bruno, why did you do that? No, I didn't do it. It was them. Uh, they decreased disclosures, which makes no sense, and increased um, appraisals. But we're talking about estimating value. And I think if you want to ask why, like I said, I think you should know the fundamentals of appraisals uh, for your profession because your profession depends on having the correct values. One of my realtors learned recently that you don't put offers on the property without knowing if it actually will appraise. Not my monkey. Yep, love it. Why? Ask PSI. Even rhymes. See that? Haha. <laughs> only has a monkey on the screen. You guys, you guys will probably only see four, but he has a monkey on the screen. She loved the story so much, and now she holds on to a monkey. All right, I don't want your monkey, by the way. All right, let's go back to this. Okay. We'll get there in a second, but Rowan is like, give me more, give me more, give me now. We'll get there in a second. But if you separate land from, from real estate, from the, the property, the building, I'm sorry, then how do you estimate land? You might have land that you can compare to around. Or you have the assessed value of a property, the tax assessed value, and you go from there. So don't cut yourself. But uh, what's the difference between the appraiser? <laughs> yeah, can't win with me, I know. What's the difference between the appraiser and the uh, disclosure? Well, <laughs> disclosure is when you're telling what's the problems with the, with the property or the conditions of the property or what the client should do or should not do. It has nothing to do with appraisal. Appraisal, no, you, you can type. Listen, it's fun. I'm not making fun of you. I understand it's the computer. You have a Mac, right? I know. Have a mind of their own. They suck. Anyway, um, I just lost half of my students by saying that. I know. Never going to, I mean, technology. So, but the appraisal is an estimate of value, while disclosures is me telling you, hey, uh, Francielli, there's mold in the basement. So, totally different things. All right. So you estimate land value. That's step number one. Step number two, we estimate the reproduction or replacement cost of improvements. So how much it would cost to, to put a new building exactly like this one. Uh, we estimate the accrued depreciation. Okay. That means how much you lost of value over time. Uh, we subtract accrued depreciation from reproduction or replacement cost. So this one minus this one. 
and then we add the land value estimated earlier to the depreciation or uh, I'm sorry, depreciated reproduction or replacement cost. To estimate land value per Rona, we got it, we got there. To estimate land value, the appraiser uses the sales comparison method, as I was saying. You're going to find properties which are comparable to the subject property in terms of land and adjust the sales price of the comparables to account for competitive distance differences between the subject property. So you get, it's a lot easier to find land than it is to find that particular type of property. Okay. Uh, the indicative values of the comparable properties are used to estimate land value of the subject. The implicit assumption is that the subject land is unimproved, vacant, unimproved, and available for the highest and best use. So, Yvette, don't worry so much about, there's no formula here. Uh, the question will be more like, in which approach do we compute land value separate from the building value? The only approach where we compute val land value separate from building value is the cost approach. So it will be a question to that effect. That I'm going through it for your knowledge because you're gonna to have to, to learn. Yeah, you still have to. Other things I'll tell you exactly we need to remember for state exam. But this, if anything, it will be a comparison of all three approaches which one is most accurate when uh, trying to figure out the value of an apartment building? Well, the income approach, the next one, right? Even worse, you said. How do we estimate reproduction or replacement cost of improvements? There are several methods for estimating uh, the reproduction or replacement cost of improvements, and these are as follows. The appraiser uses one or more new structures that are similar to the subject property, the subject improvements, and determines a cost per unit of the benchmark structures and multiplies this cost per unit times the number of units in the subject. The unit of measurement is the most commonly, de most commonly denominated in square feet. So this is the most commonly used, it's the square foot method. We're gonna look at the property, divide the, the construction or the value by the square feet, and it's gonna give me a cost per square feet. So to reach this, this number, somebody started with the unit in place method. What does that mean? It means we calculated the amount of material and labor that was, that was used here, and it cost us maybe $500,000 to build. There's 2,000 square feet. You divide the 5,000 by the 2,000 square feet and you'll know how much it costs per square foot to build a replica of this particular building. Does that make sense? So if it's sold for 500,000, I mean, if it, if it costs 500,000 and you have 2,000 square feet, divide the 500 by the two, it gives you cost per square feet. So to build another replica, it should be the same cost. So now we're gonna to go to the next property and we know it costs $200 a square foot, as an example, just putting it out, $200. This building has 10,000 square feet. What do we do? 200 times the 10,000 square feet and we have the value of the construction. So we get to the point where narrow, and, and this is the most, the most common used one, this one because even in construction they do that they already have an estimate in this area this type of property costs more or less this much all based on square feet questions I see some confused faces questions
No questions? Come on. There has to be a question. There you go. She's going to ask me about something that's coming up in the next three pages. Trying to hurry up to, for Yom Kippur. Okay, so in case you guys did not understand what I said before, which is okay, unit comparison method is commonly used in commercial or residential in all of them. When it's not possible to find enough comparables, we resort for the unit, the square foot method, or the unit in place method, whatever is, is um, uh, most applicable. But it's the reproduction, it's the cost approach, reproduction or um what do you call it reproduction or replacement so it's not about commercial or residential it's about special purpose buildings or not enough comparables right so if it's a newer construction residential we will use the cost approach if it's an older construction residential we would use the sales comparison approach for commercial if it brings income if it's an income property we use the income approach. If it's a school, a church, a special purpose building, there it doesn't bring income and that there's not many sales, we use the sales comparison approach. So what I was showing you guys here is different ways that we can find a reproduction or replacement cost. It's either we use the square foot method or we use the unit in place method or we use the quantity survey method or the index method, which um, we don't we don't use that often, but these are four different approaches to the cost approach. Four different ways to determine the cost approach. The most common one that I can answer for your question, Verona. The most common one that's used is the square foot method, which is based on experience. So I've built properties here. I know how much it costs me, more or less, for this. I'll give you an example. My uh, I right up here. I have a new air conditioned unit. The HVAC guy uh, that did this, he came in here and he measured the walls. And I'm like, I, I just need an air conditioning. Why are you measuring the walls? It feels like it feels expensive already because he's measuring the walls. He said, no, I need to know the square footage so I understand how many BTUs, right? So whatever force he has, I understand how many BTUs he will need. Otherwise, I'm doing the job twice. I'm putting something that's not enough or putting something that's too much. And you'll ask me to replace later. So the square foot method becomes based on experience. Do you understand? The first construction that was built in the area was based on unit in place method or even quantity, where we don't know what's the average cost. And I'm telling you this for another reason. If you go to PA to build something there versus building something here, the cost of material is different. I cannot go to PA to um, Allentown, for instance, I cannot go there and say, well, in Newark, this type of building is roughly $118 a square foot. So here it's $118 a square foot. Just like the sales comparison approach, different towns, different markets, right? Different states, different markets, different countries, different markets. So the cost of material and the cost of labor will change depending on the towns. So the unit in place is like the first time we built. This is how much it costs for me to build. We took note and now we divide and now we divide by the square footage. And from here on, every new construction is going to be based on square foot method. You guys got it? So it doesn't apply for commercial, residential, industrial or whatever. It's just the method when there's no comparables, no other comparables to use. So I, I'd say that the cost approach is like the last resort approach. It's a last resort. We always try to go for sales comparison first, if we have them. If not, does it generate the income? Let's look at the income approach. And if not, last resort, cost approach. You got it? Thumbs up. Okay, Chris made a face and then thumbs up. Okay, you're opening something. Got it.
All right, so moving on. How do we estimate accrued depreciation? So we have the straight line method or we have the economic age life method. The economic life, oh, sorry. The economic life is what we expect that will remain of use of life of its original use. So the cost of the structure is divided by a number of years. Given the example, a roof. Most roofs come with a 30 year warranty. So they expect that for the next 30 years, no damages to the roof. Does that make sense? That is the economic life. It will last 30 years, eventually need to be replaced. How much is it worth over time? Well, a year later, it's worth one year less of the value. So if it was uh, $30,000 for 30 years, right? That means $1,000 a year that he loses as the years go by. You guys understand? If it's a five-year-old uh, roof, it's worth more than a 25-year-old roof. That makes sense, right? The older roof is, the lesser value you'll have. So it's based on the economic life. How long will it take to be uh, replaced? Okay. The This is the cost approach right here. Here's an example how it's calculated. Land value first by direct sales comparison, 80,000. The improvements of the building plus any other structure if the total cost of new would have been 276,000 if we were to build today. Accrued depreciation is over time what the value the, the loss would be. So it's a $30,000 depreciation here. 276, which is the new construction cost minus that depreciation gives us the depreciated value of improvements. What are we going to do now? The building is worth 246. The land is worth 80. We add them both together. This property based on cost approach is 326. Here's the good news for those of you losing your head right now. Ready? There's no math question regarding the cost approach in the state exam. But I'm just letting you guys know you still have to learn the basics because eventually you will need them. Okay? But there's no cost approach math question in the exam. The next one, though, I can guarantee there's at least one. So the next one, there's math involved, but I don't want you to stress either because there's a chapter just for math. Okay? The legal one, math, legal one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Verona, yeah. You'll start by looking at that. Yes. If there's nothing, then it becomes a little bit more difficult to figure out the value. But one of these three, three approaches is going to be valid at one point. It's either there's enough sales, or there's income, or the cost approach. One of these will have some value. So you have to look at vacant land because it's land you compare it to land. There's always somewhere vacant land. And the cool thing about land is that it doesn't vary in value as much from neighborhood to neighborhood as much as the property itself, like the, the building itself will. So I go over to, to a, across the street to a different neighborhood or a different town, 5,000. 10,000 at best in terms of difference in value. So it's a lot easier to establish than the structure and desirability of the structure. You got it? Okay. Are you guys okay or? I know Robin is typing something. Yeah. 
is EMEA, there's private messages going around. People are just distracted. Anyway, all right, so next, income capitalization approach. You're drooling over Chris's food. Chris, what you got over there? Give that two. What is that? You're eating shrimp? Oh. Sure. I mean, go ahead. I go for the value meal. He goes for the extra value meal. Anyway, must be nice, right, Mr. The good lifestyle. He's just taking advantage because in about a month or less, he's not going to be eating that. They'll take it all away from him. Take advantage now, my man. That's it. <laughs> all right, income, um, income capitalization approach. So it's income generating property it could be residential it could be commercial it's the fact that generates income so it's an apartment building it could be a, a, a strip mall it could be um, <coughs> a commercial uh, setting as long as there's tenants or some type of uh, vending uh, sales that happen there's income if there's income we will use the income to determine the value of that particular property. So obviously, if there's income, there's math. If there's math, there's formulas. So we're going to have some fun over the next hour. Ready? Who's ready for math? Give me a thumbs up. All right. One, two, three. Oh, OK. All right. You guys. OK, cool. Robin goes like, nope. Erica doesn't even say anything. And Yom Kippur doesn't say anything either. Like, nope, yeah, not math. Not my Jewish side. Nope. David says, I love math. Awesome. Cool. So I'm going to flip the screen over to you, and you're going to teach this. All right, so the income capitalization approach or income approach um, is used for income properties and sometimes for other properties in the rental market where the appraiser can find rental data. The approach is based on the principle of anticipation. That means the expected future income stream of a property underlies what an investor will pay for the property. If it brings me income, I'll pay for it. If it doesn't bring me income, I will not pay that, that much for it. It's also based on the principle of substitution, meaning that an investor will pay no more for a subject property with a certain income uh, stream that the investor would pay for another property with a similar income stream. The strength of the income approach is that it's used by investors uh, themselves to determine how much they would pay for a property. Thus, in the right circumstances, it provides a good basis for estimating market value. The income capitalization approach uh, is limited in two ways. First, it is difficult to determine an appropriate capitalization rate. It's often a matter of judgment and experience, judgment and experience on the part of the appraiser. Secondly, the income approach relies on market information about income and expenses, and sometimes it's difficult to find that information. So, capitalization approach is what I'm willing to get in return for this property. So a percentage that I want to get in return for this property. And how do we determine what percentage? There's no real number. In certain places, 6% is awesome. Other places, 10% is amazing, right? But if you guys do use the 6 and 10% here, 6% might be better than 10. I'll show you in a little bit, okay? Unless you're going to deal with commercial properties, Stress about this only for exam purposes. Later on, you'll when you need it, find a commercial broker 
that or, or agent that can help you do the math, okay? That has experience in generating these reports, okay? Also, I have a video about what I'm gonna, I'm gonna show next. I have a video on YouTube, uh, just search income approach, and there's a 15 to 20 minute video where I slow down and explain every single step in two or, diff two or three different ways, all right? So I created that video for you. I know Verona, I still owe you a video. I did not forget. Okay, I'll run that video this, this weekend, put it in production, and by Monday you should have it. Okay? Wait, not Monday. I got to deliver it to you on Tuesday. Right? Monday's going to be a holiday for the video. Yvette's coming with a, with a question. Let's see. Title of the video is The Income Approach. New direction, yep. By the way, guys, great news. From yesterday to today, I increased 14 subscribers. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel for news. There's a lot of good stuff that I'm going to be adding there as well. We're going to come up with a New Direction News uh, channel. We're going to talk about current market trends, about investments. What you should do, what you should not do, and I'll bring a bunch of professionals to talk about these things, not just me. So you don't have to hear me all the time, okay? I will bring other people to speak, okay? And I'm um, going to bring uh, realtors to speak about their experience in growing in the uh, first year, what they would do different. So we're going to have a lot of good stuff happening over uh, 2021. Get ready. I might go into your production business instead. Hey, you're always welcome. I definitely need the help. You know, I want to ride a, a Kia Telluride as well. All black, right? Just saying. Yvette says, I need work. Uh, I have somebody that's, I, I'm not hiring right now as far as a salary employee. I don't know how much you're willing to, to get paid, but I have somebody and I did post in the group chat a while back, a surgery center to start. It's, I think $14 and then they bump you up. Like the person that's there has been, was there for like six months. They bumped her up to $19 an hour, um, but it's based on experience. So if you're interested to start or to have something in between, that position is available to anybody that wants. All right, next. But if, oh, by the way, I love this one. If all you need is work, Yvette, I have a bunch of it. If you need compensation, right now I just hired three people, so we're not on the point where compensation would be <laughs> involved. Oh, okay. With comps, I'll show you comparables. The benefit that you'll have by working with us and the benefit you'll have working with others. How about those comps? No? It comes with a great smile. And really bad jokes. <laughs> okay. Instead of money, how about exchange of value or love and affection? I'm sure we can find somebody. I'm bringing all the chapters back in for this question. You see that? All right. We can exchange with experience. Boom. Sold. Fabiola wants these. Love it. Fabiola hired. Now, come. Sorry, vet. Gone. You said maybe. She said definitely. That's how it works. Negotiations. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. But, um, but definitely, if, if, if you guys know anybody that's looking for a job, I got that, that position available. Great opportunity to growth. I know the manager directly and the owner of the surgery center. It's in Lindhurst, and you can make uh, really good money there. Um, as far as working with me, right now, like I said, I just hired um, three people. So a little tough to hire anybody right now. For the surgery center, it's uh, full-time. Okay. All right, back to, to this. We're straying from the 
from the class. I just have to take a stab at that. Uh, Verona will work for free. It's getting better. Between Verona, Fabio, sorry, Vet. No. Erica, what's your bid here? Come on. We got two working for free. I need somebody for production. What's your bid? You're shaking your head, no? You're rot? Yvette says, sorry, I got bills to pay. Why? Just to like everybody else. I don't know why people pay bills. David, that's it. You and Tashani are coming to work for me. That's it. Right? Is she good with math too? Perfect. Let's do it. No, I know she's a teacher. That doesn't mean she's good with math. I've had teachers in my class and they failed math miserably. So, yep. So, Shani was a, a student of mine and then she brought uh, David. She goes like, if I'm doing it, you're doing it now. And then he joined. Yep. What happened? You're just pointing. I don't know what he wants to look at. Like, where does David work? Ask him. Why are you asking me? David, where do you work? Verona? Let's do it. David's a freelancer. There you go. He's free and he's lancing over here. That's it. Done. Sold. <laughs> Love it. All right, guys, we're moving forward. We got like 50 minutes to go still. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good stuff. Make the, makes the class easier, right? And you can have fun and enjoy. All right, so income capitalization approach uh, is limited in two ways. Like I said, first is determining the proper capitalization rate, which we're going to go over right now. And then uh, knowing the income expenses of other properties or even the, the, that particular property in order to calculate. So these are the steps. Again, I have a video on this at New Direction channel, goes very slow about it. The first step is to estimate the potential gross income. Now PGI or potential gross income is based on assuming 100% occupancy, okay? But this is an assumption. It's not real because you guys know, I don't think I need to write here assumption. You guys know that a building eventually has somebody that either doesn't pay the rent or has somebody that leaves. So there's a potential for vacancy. So what we're going to do is deduct vacancy. So we'll reach the effective gross income. Effective gross income is PGI minus vacancy or rental loss so pgi minus vacancy or rental loss now i'll give you an example let's say this building right here where i'm at is five percent empty the building next door is five percent empty based on experience and over time over the past three years ten years whatever it's been on average five percent empty or people that don't pay their rents so deduct that from the hundred percent what is the effective gross income? 95%. That's the number that we can expect the property to bring. 100%, the potential, it's what we desire. The effective is what we can expect. Now, after we have the income, think about your paycheck. Don't they take out deductions? Okay, so if we have an effective gross income, do you think that's what we take home? No, we need to figure out the net income. How do we figure out the net income? It's EGI, which is the effective gross income, this one, right? EGI minus expenses. So it costs $30,000 a year to maintain this building plus uh, taxes plus insurance so now we're at fifty thousand dollars okay 
So if the property brings 100,000 and if it was 100% minus the 5% estimated vacancy, then only 95,000 comes in. Minus the $50,000 expense, we reach the NOI, NOI, which is net operating income. And now we are at um, 95,000 minus the 50, right? So $45,000 is the net operating income. You guys good so far? Okay, good. This part is easy. We're just deducting, right? Easy. Then we're going to select a capitalization rate. I'll explain later how do we get to capitalization rates. It's coming soon to a page near you. Uh, so we select the, <laughs> the capitalization rate that's applicable in the area, right? And we apply the capitalization rate. So we apply NOI, which is the net operating income. We divide by the cap rate. And that will equal value. Guys, we're going to repeat all this. I'm just giving you a quick synopsis of where we had it. Okay. And the reason why I don't like to talk much about, um, about the income, <coughs> income approach is a lot of people ask, what's a good cap rate? It depends. That's why we're going to go to cap rates in a little bit. But it depends because there's the entry cap rate and there's the exit cap rate. There's a cap rate to purchase and there's a cap rate to sell. So you want to sell at the lowest cap rate, the lowest percentage. That's the highest value you're going to get. Okay. But for state exam, you just need to know this basic calculation. All right, uh, Verona. Here's another way. <clears throat> we'll get more in detail to this one in a little bit. Here's another way to figure out the potential gross income potential gro gross income is the schedule rent of the subject plus income of miscellaneous sources such as vending machines if we have um, a house for instance that has um, let's say six units they bring a thousand dollars each but then downstairs in the basement we have uh, laundry machines with coins those are vending right vending machines we'll, we'll consider it that way it's vending so let's say we also put next to the vending machine to the washing machines if you're smart you put a little soda machine and a little chocolate or whatever machine while people are doing the laundry i don't know if you ever got hungry while doing laundry but you know after a while you might it's right there it's appealing come for me right so any little money that you make from the property it increases the value of your property so we have the scheduled rent which would be 100 percent occupied plus other income so potential gross income an appraiser may estimate the potential gross rental income using current market rental rates so market rent the rent specified by leases in effect on the property so contract rents and then or a combination of both the market rent is determined by market studies in a process similar to the sales comparison method. Contract rent is used primarily if the existing leases are not due to expire in the short term and the tenants are unlikely to fail or leave the lease. How do we estimate the effective gross income? Like I said, you have the potential gross income, so 100% occupied plus pending sales minus the vacancy so empty or lack of payments this is what we can expect got it this is what we can expect from the property i'm gonna say up here sorry Wishful thinking, because you wish you had 100% occupied plus income from all places. Wishful thinking, this is not the real number. 
we deduct the potential vacancy rent collection losses the estimate of so this right here is an estimate right and we reach what we can expect which is the effective gross income or EGI All right. Next. How do we figure out the estimate net operating income or NOI? Very important that you know this as NOI. How do we calculate NOI? The net operating income is the effective gross income minus operating expenses. Operating expenses. It's the cost of keeping okay, actually let me this way. Keeping the lights on. That means what it, what does it cost for the building to be operating? Taxes, insurance, uh, property management, utilities, all that stuff goes into the total operating expenses to reach the NOI. So tax insurance and maintenance, yes. And utilities. All that stuff goes into it. Okay? So it goes to operating expenses. And then we reach the most important thing, which is the NOI. Right here. Operating expenses in green, so I just addressed this. Operating expenses do not include debt service. They do not include debt service. Debt service is expenditures for capital, uh, debt service expenditures for capital improvements or expenses not related with the operation of the property. So what I want you to add here, debt service is mortgage or any financing against property okay so debt service does not include mortgage or any financing against the property so debt service mortgage or any financing against the property so i can demand in my calculations taxes insurance maintenance utilities everything even property manager property management even if i'm the property manager i have to put that there but i cannot use debt service the mortgage as a value uh to be added in expenses next thing we're going to do is select the capitalization rate now capitalization rate is an estimate of rate of return rate of return ROR okay ROR or rate of return is the same thing or cap rate is the same thing that an investor will demand on an investment of capital in the property such as a subject so it's what we expect somebody to pay in this area the judgment and market knowledge of the appraiser play an essential role in selection of an appropriate rate for the subject property in most cases the appraiser will research capitalization rates used in similar properties in the market. So how do we figure out the cap rate? We look for comparable sales in the market and how much they brought as cap rate. Okay. Same thing. The appraiser will use research capitalization rates in other properties. So this is a building that has income. 
I'm going to have another building that has income. And I'm going to see what's the cap rate in that building, how much it went for. I'm going to look at the building that's across the street and see how much it is. I'm going to look at the other building, how much was the cap rate. Those are the comparisons I'm going to make. If all of them are at a similar cap rate, then what am I doing? Applying to this property. Okay. So what we do is what I showed you earlier, NOI divided by cap rate equals uh, value. All right, Erica, have a good weekend. Good luck with wherever you're going. Don't forget production here on Monday. It's a holiday, so you can come here. Thanks. All right. Bring your Kia so I can so I can go on the ride. <laughs> I'll go on the ride along. There you go. I don't know. Ask your boss. <laughs> I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> Bring those money and the kids. That'll be the double pay. Okay, don't bring them. Don't give me that face. Don't bring them. Anyway. So NOI <coughs> divides by uh, uh, cap rates to give you value. So income divided by rate equals value. We're going to go over that in a second. So here's an example. And notice that I highlighted the whole thing because this could be an actual question. They will tell you in the question, they'll tell you this property brings roughly $192,000 uh, of gross rental or rental income plus $2,000 of other uh, concessions like laundry, vending machines, and so on. The other thing they'll tell you is they have a, a rent vacancy or collection losses of X percentage, or in this case, they gave you an actual number. All we have to do is deduct. As you guys can see, we're deduct, deduct, deduct until we get to the NOI like I did before. Once we have the effective gross income, which is minus vacancy, minus uh, collection losses, we're going to figure out how much it costs to run. So, Robin, you're asking maintenance, right? Yeah, maintenance is here, but there's a whole lot of other things that that have to be in place for the business, for the building to keep on running. Real estate taxes, insurance, utilities, repairs, the maintenance, management, uh, reserves, uh, legal and accounting. All this goes into consideration as a cost of keeping the lights on, the cost of operating the business and the building. In this case, 84000 what we're going to do now is we got the effective gross income, the EGI, and we're going to deduct the expenses we have. And we reach, again, the most important number, NOI, which is where you take home after all these expenses and losses. This is what you can expect from this property, $100,000. Now, if... The cap rate that we found to be common in properties of this style, if the cap rate we found in the area was 7%, then that's what we're going to apply to this property. So income or NOI divided by the rate 7% or 0 0.07, this property is worth 1434300 That's how much you would pay for this property. Okay, a property that brings you 100000 every year. Not that hard, right, guys? It's just remembering how to do these deductions. And the formula, don't worry about it. There's variations of this formula that might give you this value and give you the rate. What's the net operating income? They might give you net operating income. They might give you the value. What's the cap rate? So it'll give you variables of this. But I have one tool that I'll show to you on, on, in the math class. One tool that takes all these formulas away. One tool that if you understand to use it, you can apply for um, percentages, you can apply for tax rates, you can apply for insurance, you can apply for uh, income property, you apply for everything. One tool, no formulas. Okay? And no, the tool is not the calculator. You still need the calculator separate from this tool that I'll give you. Is that a deal? Okay, don't stress about 
this right now. Now, um, one more time going back to Verona, and I'm sorry to keep on bringing you up, but it's about the questions you, you were asking before. I want to make sure I plug it in to answer you and everybody gets to know it, which is, Robin, start saying a stupid question. But the answer is yes, it's for rentals, rental income properties. But stop saying stupid questions. There's no stupid question, okay? okay. Uh, actually, there is. There is a stupid question. The one you hold in. The one you don't ask. That's guaranteed to be the most stupid question you'll have. Got it? Okay. So, res gross rent multiplier, right here. Gross rent multiplier. We use these for, um, so Verona, you're asking about a, a, a rent, right? So a single family, right? So look right here. The gross rent multiplier or the gross income multiplier approaches are simplified income-based methods used primarily for properties that produce or might produce income, but that they are not necessarily or primarily income properties. See, a single family, traditionally for somebody to live in and own it right not for rental property but it could be so the examples are single uh, family homes and duplexes the methods consist of applying a multiplier to the estimated gross income or gross rent of the subject the multiplier is derived from market data uh, on sales price and gross income or rent gross rent The advantage of the income uh, multiplier is that it offers a relatively quick indication of value using informal methodology. However, the approach leaves many variables out of the consideration, such as vacancies, credit losses, and operating expenses. In addition, the appraiser must have a market rental data to establish multipliers. Meaning, we gotta have a lot of properties, just like the, the cap rate approach, we have to have a lot of properties that are rentals, right? And we say, okay, sold for X amount of dollars, the rentals were X amount uh, per month. Another property, X amount of dollars sold, rentals were this. So once we evaluate several properties that sold recently, even if different properties, even if they are two family to compare to the single family, the income, the gross rent multiplier approach or this type of income approach allows you to take these variables out. The fact that there's no single family available like you didn't have one, Right? The fact you don't have one, you can use a two family and bring a value to a single family. You got it? Because we're gonna use the multiplier or the common denominator in that particular two family to another two family to another two family, it's gonna give us a number that we can multiply to our property, okay? So it's gonna get clearer now. So the first is you select the gross rent multiplier by examining the sales price and monthly rents, like I was just saying, of pri properties that sold recently. The appraiser's judgment and market knowledge are critical in determining an appropriate gross rent multiplier for the subject. The gross rent multiplier uh, for a property is price, so sales price, okay? Divided by the gross monthly rent equals the gross rent multiplier multiplier so x okay so sales price divided by gross monthly rent equals grm or gross rent multiplier already gives you the hint what you're going to do next right if this is a multiplier what you're going to do next is apply the grm you're going to multiply, because that's what, what this is, right? Multiplier, so you're gonna multiply to your property. So we're gonna estimate that wrench, let's say that wrench, if it was for rental, that wrench would bring 2,500. We would put here. You got it? We figured out that the average rental or gross rent multiplier is 150. What would we do? We would multiply. Good so far? I'm, I'm going to show you a better example in a little bit. Once we have this, multiply the two of them, and we have the estimated value. 
Okay. So three seventy five is the value estimated value if this was the case. So if your property rented would be twenty five hundred, if the average gross rent multiplier out there is one fifty, your property is worth three seventy five. So here's the example. We're going to go close to the numbers I was saying, actually. Uh, we're going to go to comparable properties. So we got four comparable properties. This property sold for 500. This property sold for 248. This one for 324. This one for 304. You guys see the disparity in, in between one, one value and another? Right? Huge difference. How can I use this as comparables? By finding their common denominator, which is the GRM. So if you look here, the rental on this one is 1660, 1500, 2200, and 1800. The GRM 151, 165, 147, 169. The average of these numbers, the average of it is 160. The average, well, actually, this is your property. So the average of those numbers is 160. Okay, so no, no, this is the gross rent multiplier. This is this price divided by that equals, 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 equals. Okay, and then the opposite is multiply. So, Ron, I think I, I, I just answered, right? So what you guys will do is now the average because 151 plus 165, 147 plus one. It's around 158 actually. So the number would be 158 unless I put one of these numbers wrong. The average would be 158, they put 160. So if you guys do now the 160 that's there, so 160, times 2,000, it's 320,000. So we're going to multiply GRM by the rentals, and that gives us this number. So again, guys, these are not units. This is what we figure out that was common in the area. The average of these numbers is what's common in the area for rental. So every rental follows a pattern. Meaning, this property right here rents a two-bedroom at $2,000. What do you think the property next door will rent a two-bedroom at? $2,000. So the price of this property should actually be very similar. Right? And look at here. You have a good example here. There's a 304 and a 324. Look at the monthly rents. This one brings more, therefore worth more. You got it? Ours brings $200 less, less, so it's worth less than that one. So the rents determine the value. There's a, there's a balance, an equilibrium here between the properties in the area. And we use that GRM to determine what that value is, much like cap rate. All right? Questions? Okay, Yurka, you're looking at it, you're looking at it, you're looking at it. Let me do this. This is property A we're going to use as a comparable, property A. He recently sold for $500,000, okay? The monthly rent that this property was bringing was 1660 the sales price divided by 1660 gives us this number, 151. Got it? <clears throat> the next property says, property B, comparable, it was sold for 248 and it was bringing 1500. If this number divided by this number gives us a GRM of 165.
right here. Property C sold for 324. The rental income he had was 2,200. Sales price divided by monthly rent, 147. So what we're trying to figure out here, guys, is a pattern <clears throat> between all these four properties. And these are local properties. So if your property's right here in the middle and these are around, we assume that your property falls into the same pattern. And that's why we're gonna look at an average GRM, 160, to determine the value of your property. So if these GRMs were calculated by dividing monthly rent, here, this GRM will be multiplied by the rent that comes from the property you're trying to sell. Your property brings 2,000. GRM average is 160. We can safely assume $320,000 is the value of your home if you want to sell it. So again, this is when there's no other ways to compare it to. We're going to use the income. Uh, Muslim has a question on income properties does the condition also determine the value well <clears throat> obviously condition will have a little factor into it absolutely but usually traditionally the rent roll is determined by the condition like you don't pay three thousand dollars for a property that's destroyed does that make sense so the rent roll traditionally goes based on condition or amenities that the property brings if the property has a pool, you're asking for more. So yeah, it's worth more. The conditions definitely go into play. Verona is asking, do you still use the half mile radius when calculating rental properties? Yep. You're not gonna compare this property in a totally different market. The GRMs will be a little bit different. Like in an area like, <clears throat> I have a property in, uh, Close to Delaware. Forgot the name of that place. Uh, Deepwater. So I have a property in Deepwater, close, right next door from Delaware. It's like you can cross the river and be there. And the same property here, exactly the same property here, would be like uh, maybe six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar property. Over there, it's two hundred and fifty. It's for sale if anybody wants. Uh, the rental there is like $800 a month on one side and 900 and something on the other side. That rental over here in Newark would have been like 1800 and 1900 or 2000 or even more for that particular type of property. All right, Muslima, no problem. Thank you. You understand? So for that particular type of property. So obviously this relationship of sales price to monthly rent also varies from town to town. It might not bring you the same. So you have to compare one property, two properties, three properties, four within the same region, within the same mileage if possible. They no longer have to be an equivalent, right, to, to your particular property, but something that gives you uh, an understanding of the property. Best example I can give you. If you guys go to Rentometer or Rentometer, right, whatever you want to call it, um, <coughs> Rentometer or rentometer, they uh, you put in, you plug in the uh, value, I mean the address of the property, and you say it's a one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four. You put like there whatever, and how many bath uh, it has. You click go, and it tells you the average rental. It tells you the medium rental, and it tells you minimum and max. So that will help you figure these things out to, as well. You guys understand? Yep. Possibly. It could be a typo. The point is still the same. So it could be it could be a typo here. Here it could have been three hundred maybe. Actually, I'll tell you right now. It's uh, 250, maybe.
So right here, it could have, could have been a typo. Don't, don't worry too much about it. The point is still the same. You need to have comparables, come up with the average, and um, that's the number you're going to use. All right? With that being said, the next thing that comes in is regulation of appraisal practice. Not many questions in the state exam about regulation of appraisal practice. All you need to really know is that they follow uh, the uniform standards of the professional appraisal. You can have um, certifications to, to be an appraiser. There's different levels of appraisals. There's a residential appraisal, there's a general appraisal, and all those go based on experience and amount of hours, uh, study hours. So not heavily tested in the state. What you should really focus on is the income approach and learning a little bit about the cost approach. And the sales comparison approach is the most common one, so definitely go for it. Okay. Any questions? Robin left, just ran away. Come back, Robin. Questions, no questions. Oh, she's back. All right, cool. Now we can say goodnight. <laughs> Any questions, guys, or no? Princelli is like, can I have an Excedrin? <laughs> There's a lot to cover. That's why I broke this into two parts, uh, especially the math part came on the second half because it's, uh, I know it can get confusing. I'll give that one once we do the math. So that's chapter 30. Like I said, don't stress too much. Right now, I understand the concept of it, and then we do the math. Okay. Questions? Questions? Going once, twice. How can I do this for so long? I love what I do. Every day, morning and evening. And then I go handle it in real life. <clears throat> so not only just teaching theory, I actually put it in practice. It, it's not hard. I know you did. It's not hard um, once you get into it. I remember when I took the exam, when I took the exam, when I did the class, there was people falling asleep, including myself. But that's why I try to keep j giving you jokes. I try to get you guys involved in something that will keep you guys kind of awake. Some of you annoyed, but kind of awake that everybody's, you know, participating. But yeah, it was tough for me too uh, in 2005. So I totally understand. Okay. But that's why asking questions like you after the first 20 minutes, by the way, we start at, uh, at 540 on average, 540. By 6 p.m. I already lost you. I know how it is. Like everything else that I'm saying is wah, 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 wah. I know how it is. Right. That's why I stop joke. Um, give you the break I know how it is but if you guys don't do then your part which is asking me questions Bruno I was studying this can you explain again or I'll create a quick video which I've done in the past and I'll do it again now one for Verona uh, I will create something and explain in three different ways or four different ways or ten different ways to get the point across and I don't mind it's it's my pleasure to do it I love doing this okay so Interacting makes more memorable. There you go. <clears throat> makes it easier. Not smart. I love what I do. When you love what you do, things come easy. So, but I appreciate it. All right, guys. Any questions? Anything you want to address before we go and enjoy the weekend? Verona, do I do... Yes, uh, uh, Robin, thank you. I am <laughs> about this 100% do I do tutoring <clears throat> so 
It's exactly what I'm asking you because tutoring can only happen once you find the problem. If you don't tell me where you're having problems, like asking questions like, hey, this, I was studying. If you don't find where you're having problems and you don't send to me or ask me, it's tough for me to say, hey, uh, this is your problem. This is where we need to fix or this is how to do it. Might as well repeat the whole book. So the studying, well, I know, plat map. Don't worry too much about that. That was a simple thing that might help you uh, pass the exam as soon as you get it. Everything else is way more important than the plat map or, or uh, the meets and bounds or the townships. Everything else. But again, my point is WhatsApp, you can reach me. Email, you can reach me. Um, if you go to, to our website, there's a, there's a link at the bottom that now shows up, that pops up, it says uh, Messenger. Like, I mean, there's so many ways that you can reach out to me. And I will explain, that's part of tutoring. I had a student that came here, we were here for three hours. But the student brought a bunch of questions from the practice exams, from Quizlet, from class. Do you understand? And we sat down to go over those. And he got to a point where as the student was going through, oh, uh, present, monitor, oh, yeah, this is what you were saying before. Yeah, I got it now. So this is this. I'm like, yep. So after an hour and a half, more, maybe two hours, I started sitting back, relaxing. And the student was answering her own questions. So without understanding where you are, I could not tutor anything. Okay. Nope, not going to happen. I will create the video. It will be available. I'll explain all that stuff in very uh, slow and different types of things. Because I know here sometimes it gets a little fast paced in certain topics, but I will break it down more in videos. Yep. Yvette, when the mortgage sells, by the way, no student left behind, okay? I've been nurturing my students, some of them for three years, and they came back and they're now doing it. I have a student that just passed the state exam. I think it was uh, this week. She posted there. This week, she was my student two years ago. Almost three years ago. So I don't give up on you. Don't you give up on yourself, okay? Now, when the mortgage sells, <clears throat> whoop, hold on. When the mortgage lender sells during this time, is it negative or just standard? I'm a little lost question. Was there anything else to it? Nope. Anything else to the question? No, uh, here it's, it's a simple concept, which is life happens. So I've had courses where, good night Fabiola, thank you. Arellis is listening, lover, amazing person. Um, so yeah, I'm still, for, for a while I've been helping a few people, you know why? It happened to me, it happened to me where I took a course and I went to take the exam and before I took the exam, I got a call that I needed to go to Portugal. My mom was sick. That year, she passed away, unfortunately. Right? So, life happens. I went to try to take that course again. I have my back injury that particular week. I was in so much pain, I couldn't take the exam. So, twice, the same exam for different reasons. Life happens. I'm sure a lot of people, now I'm reading this question, I'll address it. Yvette. I'm sure a lot of people were expecting to do a lot of things this year. And then this happened. Life happened. So why did it took three years? I have people in my previous class. He said, I went to three different schools already, Bruno. And I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. That's it. Determination. Life happens. First, first time he had a, um, an issue with his knee. The other time it was a job. He got a job promotion and he couldn't give it up. You know, and third time he's doing it. Simple as that. Life happens. All right, Nirka. I'll enjoy my weekend, but I'll enjoy even better if you guys ask me questions. I know you're studying. All right. Uh, mortgage lender sells to another mortgage lender during COVID for Barron's. Okay. So assignment, assignment of mortgages is legal. It's like me giving you a check to pay you, right? 
and you go cash the check at a check cashing place. What you just did was assign the, the check to the check cashing place and they deposit it to their account. So this is not illegal. What's illegal is for them to enforce foreclosure or any other type of uh, program against you. That's illegal right now. You understand? So transferring from one lender to another, nothing wrong. It's like me telling you, hey, uh, Francielli owes me money. Would you like to collect it? The interest is 20%. If you give me now $100, it's sold to you and you collect the, the 200 or whatever it is over the next few years. Okay? So, yeah, the new, supposedly, the new term, uh, the new um, assignee, the, the new lender, has to abide by the agreement if it's signed in paper, if it's, um, if it's uh, written by, signed in paper, written and, and notarized and all that good stuff, filed wherever it needs to be filed. If nothing got lost, yeah, they're supposed to follow it. Okay. You're welcome. Anybody else? Night, night. All right, guys, enjoy your weekend. If you do have questions, bring them out, please. Let me help you. Let's get this rolling. 2021 is coming, and I wish you a lot of success. So come on. Let's do this. Send me messages. Send me inquiries. Do it. Take care, guys. Have a good night.